May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be a blessing to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Going back to his hometown, a former army drill sergeant took a new job as a school teacher. But sadly, just before the school year started, he injured his back. He was required to wear a plaster cast around the upper part of his body. But fortunately, the cast fit under his shirt and wasn't really noticeable. On the first day of school, he found himself assigned to probably the toughest class in the school. Smart Alec kids had already heard that the new teacher was a former drill sergeant, and they were a bit wary of him. They decided to see how tough he really was before they started playing any pranks on him. Walking confidently into the rowdy room, the new teacher opened the window wide and sat down at his desk. When a strong breeze made the teacher's tie flap, he picked up a stapler and promptly stapled the tie to his chest. He had no trouble with discipline that year, funnily enough. Now the Gospel reading from Mark 6, 1-13 occurs just after the healing of a woman with a hemorrhage and the raising of Jairus's, Jairus from the dead. It is two different stories about faith, but that's pretty much where the similarity ends. The first parable we heard in this passage is about the lack of faith. By the time Jesus returned to his hometown of Nazareth, the stories of his healings and miracles had spread far and wide. Even the people in his hometown had heard of his popularity. So you would, you would think that he would have been accepted by the hometown crowd and welcomed with open arms. Unfortunately, this was not the case. He was seen as the son of a carpenter or the son of Mary and Joseph, and not as the son of God. It would be like me being called, be, called by God to be an evangelist like somebody like Billy Graham, complete with worldwide crusades and thousands of people coming to Christ in faith. Then if I returned home and conducted a crusade there, would I be seen as the man of God or just the son of Fred the high school teacher and Marilyn the pharmacist? Jesus was surprised by the unbelief of the crowd, and not because he was expecting to be welcomed as a hometown hero. The lack of faith always caused Jesus to be amazed because he is all-knowing, almighty, all-present, and all-loving. Why would somebody not trust him? If you consider the population of Nazareth at the time of Jesus, you can understand why he was not accepted. For starters, most of the people were poorly educated, and if they had any education at all. They could not read the precious scrolls in the synagogue, so the only way they would learn their religious heritage was to listen to the rabbis who were educated. Jesus did not have the formal training required for rabbis, so in the eyes of the people, he was just a local boy who was putting on airs. And to make matters worse, the scribes in Jerusalem had been spreading rumors about Jesus rumors which had also reached Nazareth. For example, in Mark chapter 3, verse 23, Jesus was actually accused of working with the devil. A son was expected to follow in his father's footsteps, but not go beyond them. If a boy's father was a carpenter, then the son was to be a carpenter as well, but nothing more. When the people heard Jesus teaching in the synagogue, they were on the verge of applauding him, but they didn't because they saw him just as a carpenter. But what they failed to see was that Jesus was, follow, was following in his father's footsteps, his heavenly father. Jesus really upset them when he told them that it takes outsiders to see what the locals refuse to see. In this area, we are pretty much the same, aren't we? I remember when we first moved to Port Elizabeth and I spoke to a friend about opening my own accounting firm. I was told that it wasn't such a good idea because A, I wasn't a local, and B, I didn't, hadn't gone to the right school, and people just didn't know who I was. Well, that was 24 years ago, and my business is still doing quite well. So why couldn't Jesus perform many miracles in Nazareth? It was simply because of the lack of faith. We know that unbelievers, like the people of Nazareth, often fail to tap into God's power. If they had put faith in Jesus' wisdom, they would have heard God's guidance and encouragement. If they had looked deeper into Jesus' cures, 
they would have seen God reaching out to rescue them. Instead, they missed out on one of the greatest miracles of all time. Jesus took this re rejection in his stride and continued his ministry by sending out the 12 disciples. He sent them out with the barest of essentials, one cloak and a staff. He wanted them to trust God to provide for their needs. He wanted them to, to, to complete, accomplish and concentrate solely on their mission. Plus, Jewish custom at the time was to offer hospitality to travelers. Jesus wanted the disciples to stay at the first house that offered them a place to stay in each city or town that they visited, rather than moving from house to house. Warnings about the trappings of affluence need to be heard again today, especially when we hear of the millions and millions of rands that flow into these Christian, so-called Christian ministries, where money is used to finance the leaders' lifestyles rather than being used to do God's work in the world. They need to be more like some of the Roman Catholic priests in that functional simplicity is better. Some Catholic priests have very few possessions of their own and they have to rely on their parish parishes for housing, furnishings and even hospitality. God calls us to let go of some of the assumptions and rules we have about how we have always done things. The rules can be more of an obstacle than an aid in our spiritual journey. He calls us to leave behind our pride and our ego. He stripped these things from us so that we might travel light again and rely on God's power alone to guide us and trust his grace to support and sustain us. So why did Jesus send out the 12 in pairs? He had three main reasons. Firstly, a partner provides strength, protection and companionship. Second, a partner also provides credibility. Deuteronomy 15 verse 19 required two or three witnesses in order to convict a person of a crime because a single witness was likely to make a mistake. For the same reason, one witness had less credibility than two. And finally, a partner holds people accountable. A person is like, less likely to succumb to temptation when accompanied by a partner. Jesus also wanted to know that his disciples would travel the open roads of Palestine penniless and expecting to be welcomed with open arms, especially in their own hometowns. He also wanted them to know that the gospel message was a hard one to preach and a hard one sometimes to hear, not popular, not easy, and not automatically earning respect, especially at home. Those who refuse to show proper hospitality or those who refuse to listen to the disciples' message were to be treated as pagans. As such, the disciples were to do what the Jews did after they walked through the Gentile lands, namely shake the dust off their feet as they left. Not only did this warn the offenders, it freed the disciples to move to more fertile territory, just like Jesus did after the people of Nazareth rejected him. Jesus and his disciples always challenged the status quo, and we need more people like them today. We need people who will speak the truth and shake us out of our comfortable lives. We need people who will comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. We need people who will cooperate with God's plan for their lives. In other words, we need people of faith. Just like the people of Nazareth did, did not really know Jesus, it is possible for us to also not really know Jesus. We can understand him and what he can do for us, but we often play it safe and refuse to take risks. More importantly, we might not know him personally. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things in the world. Jesus was just an ordinary man in the eyes of the people of Nazareth, but he was God in human form and he could do extraordinary things. Every Christian has a part to play in God's master plan. The story represents one of the few failures in Jesus' ministry, but it also shows his human side. Like Jesus, we will all face failure at some point in our lives. It might be a sense of failure as a provider in, in, in life, or a sense of failure in some other form. Failure is hard because society has conditioned us for success. 
but it has not adequately prepared us for failure. Those who re accept God's call to follow him will face rejection in many forms, persecutions, insults, hostility, contempt, scorn, the list goes on. They are the common situations for those who accept the call. Just like Christ rejected the way of glory and, and found glory in obedience and death, we must also reject the way of the world and accept the way of the cross. Christianity is not a religion for those who want success or power in the traditional worldly sense. Jesus faced failure, but he kept on going. We can face failure and keep on going if we have the faith, the courage, the wisdom and the strength that come with believing in Jesus and the fellowship with our fellow Christians. When Jesus sent the 12 disciples out, he prepared them to handle failure. He constantly prepares us for failure through his word and our faith. If we want to do something for the gospel or for God, we have to believe them and behave according to these teachings. We must have faith and let our actions match this faith. And when we do, Christ will do deeds of power through us and the world will be blessed by our having been there. Amen.